Beyond Resilience is a series of curated conversations created by Firelight. Beyond Resilience does a lot to keep people connected and keep people talking about films or talking about issues, um, connecting our filmmakers and other filmmakers together. We wanted to create a space where our community, that is BIPOC documentary filmmakers, could lead a conversation. We have to do a better job of knowing that films aren't just what we can physically see on the screen. It's about the people that put in the blood, sweat, and tears behind the scenes. Knowing that what you're so passionate about, someone looks at as unmarketable or niche. Who's the audience for this? Who's going to care about this, right? And, and those simple things that people say are like daggers to you. I think that is the part of the, the violence of the model minority shit, you know, that it like shaves away our history of resistance, of rebellion, of, of ferocity. We have always resisted. We have always fought back in many different forms. It's an evolving form. You have to evolve or not you will stagnate. You have to have intention to change and you have to understand that you're not changing to, to try to give anybody a gift, but you're changing so that you can do your job better. What we're asking for is just proportional access, proportional resources, proportional marketing money so that it does actually meet its mission, so that it does actually um, lean into the diversity of perspectives. I hope that Beyond Resilience will keep its edge, um, will keep pushing the boundaries of the conversations that we need to have, and will keep growing its audiences, pulling in new people from the industry, outside the industry. It continues to be a space where people can have a BIPOC creator-led conversation. That is what it's about. Hey everyone, thanks for joining us. I hope you and your loved ones are safe and well. My name is Lucy Mukherjee. My pronouns are she and they, and I'm the director of Firelight Media's longest running program, The Documentary Lab. Um, a quick visual description for those who need it. I have dark shoulder length hair and I'm wearing a black t-shirt in front of a white wall. I am joining this event from the UK. I'm in Sussex on the Southeast coast of England, which is where I was raised. And I want to invite everyone watching to introduce yourself in the chat. The Firelight team uh, stands in solidarity with Indigenous people worldwide, and we ask our audience to be mindful of Indigenous sovereignty and land rights in their communities. So follow the link in the chat and learn about whose ancestral land you're on to make your own land acknowledgement. As some of you already know, I have a particular interest in the topic of equity and transparency at film festivals. And I've spoken out about this right here in a previous episode of Beyond Resilience. Before I became the director of Firelight's Doc Lab, I was a film festival programmer for many years, most notably at Outfest and Tribeca. So I've had a front row seat to the internal politics, the conflicting agendas and the incredible egos that populate the film festival landscape and overshadow the curation work. So I'm always eager for conversations that bring the focus back to the artists and the arts workers who make film festivals possible. The moderator of today's conversation has been unapologetically interrogating these issues in the new Distribution Advocates podcast. And I'm eager to hear what she and our panelists have to say about the journey from film festivals to industry awards. Can filmmakers leverage the increasing corporate presence at festivals? And is there a way to make the festival machine work for you? Before I hand over, I'd like to say a special thank you to our ASL interpreter, Sharon pierre Luis, and many thanks to the Beyond Resilience team, Jean-Pierre Regis, our series producer, Justin Sherwood, Firelight's communications director, Patty Marte, our communications manager, who is moderating the YouTube chat today, and our technical producer, Geronimo Saldana, and his team at OnPoint Studios. For closed captions, uh, you can check out the lower right-hand corner of your YouTube screen. And finally, a special thank you to our ongoing Beyond Resilience supporters, including Open Society Foundation, 
the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, the National Endowment for the Arts, and Field of Vision for making these conversations possible. And now I will throw it over to our moderator, Avil Speaks, who is the co-founder of Distribution Advocates and the host of the excellent podcast, Distribution Advocates Presents. Avril is an award-winning producer whose films have played various festivals, including at the upcoming edition of South by Southwest, and whose projects have aired on Netflix, Discovery Plus, Fox Media, and more. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much, much for leading, leading this conversation, conversation Avril. Thank you so much, Lucy. Um, and thank you all for joining us today. I know this is going to be an eye-opening conversation on festivals and awards and the pipeline that exists there. So joining me today, I have two well-respected filmmakers that have various films under their belts and a keen sense of the way that the industry works. And so we have Dar Darcy McKinnon, who produces documentaries about the American South and Caribbean, including A King Like Me and Role Play, which both are premiering at South by Southwest this coming week, and also Commuted, which uh, aired on PBS, um, or which is airing on PBS, and uh, Algiers America, um, The Neutral Ground. Um, she is also the recipient of uh, American Documentaries 2023 Inaugural Creative Visionary Award. Um, thank you, Darcy, for being here. And then we also have Sierra Ulrich. Did I get it right? <laughs> kind of, <laughs> kind of, but not really. <laughs> Uh, Sierra is an award-winning Iranian-American uh, filmmaker and an interdisciplinary visual artist based in Vermont. Uh, she was recently honored in Doc New York City's 2023 40 Under 40 list, and she was nominated for an Independent Spirit Award. And her first feature film, Junam, premiered in competition at the 2023 Sundance Film Festival and took home three jury awards for Best Documentary. She also works professionally as an editor and a director. Thank you, Sierra. Thank you. Please tell me your last name. I know I got it wrong. Say your last Yurik. name. Yurik. 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 <laughs> Thank it you. It throws everyone for a loop. So no, no <laughs> worries at all. <laughs> Thank you both for being here. So um, as Lucy mentioned, uh, Distribution Advocates started this podcast, um, Distribution Advocates Presents. And one of the topics that we talk about is one of the episodes is about film festivals and I wanted to start the conversation off with you, Darcy. Um, and if you could just talk a little bit about how you've you've done a number of films, how have you seen the role of film festivals shift in the last decade? Uh, do you think that their power and influence has increased or decreased and and how? Um, thanks so much. And thanks, Avril. And I I'm also just think it's uh, important to mention how important the Distribution Advocates Presents has been in the past month or so as we're all kind of coming off a year of reckoning with the distribution landscape, feeling like the bottom was taken out from under us. So it's been a real bomb and um, we're excited to talk to you. Um, so I, I think a couple things. Uh, Filmmaking is not my only career. So I was also a teacher and also ran a nonprofit. And so I think I've come into producing full time with a bit of an understanding of like, or what I thought was an understanding of that, that this industry is unique and, but I, I could get my hands around it. But I think what's been interesting over the past two years is seeing such a big shift in what my expectations were and starting to kind of uh, blow up some of the things that I didn't even understand understand beforehand were like inherently held biases or or misbeliefs around it. Um, I was thinking about this today, and I, um, this year was Sundance's 40th anniversary, right? So it is the 20th, 40th, 30th anniversary of a, many of the festivals that make up the festival landscape we know today, right? There's a lot of younger ones, but all of the big ones and and many regional or niche festivals are in that like 20 years old, 30 years old, 40 years old. And that's um, a really hard thing to do organizationally. So like all props to people who are running film festivals and figuring out how to make it work. But when you're a 40 year old institution, you're an institution, right? There's inertia that is, is attached to it. 
And, you know, a lot of, especially the big festivals have staffs of, of 30, 40, 50 people, and then, you know, triple it, quadruple it during festival um, actual season. And I think it's important for us to realize as we're going into those spaces that like these festivals have to support and sustain themselves. And the way that has become, I think, more efficient to do it is to do it through sponsorship, right? And to do it through partnerships that are not necessarily going to prioritize the independent filmmaker because we don't have any money, right? So we are not, through our filmmaking, significantly contributing to the institutional uh, overhead of the organizations that host these festivals. And I think that's an inherent conflict that it has to, you have to remember and tease apart when you think about it. Um, and so, yeah, I think we've all seen it. I mean, um, from local film festivals to the big three or big five, depending on how you define it, because there's not huge infrastructure for arts organization funding in the United States. And um, because the way nonprofits are set up or because the way some festivals are for profits, these corporate partnerships and, and kind of direct partnerships with studios and platforms have come to define how these institutions are able to keep their festivals going. And so then there's just this strange bedfellows moment that we all have when we drag our little independently funded films where we've you know scraped our last pennies to get to bond ENO, right? Or to pay for a music license that you didn't think you're gonna have to pay for, or to like get your DCP made. And then you're you're going, if you are so lucky to be accepted into these spaces, there's a really a strange bedfellows moment in terms of who you're rubbing elbows with and, and what the expectations are. And then I think the other thing that's just been really clear is like for what we do, which is doc work, um, the space for truly independent docs continues to shrink even at the festivals, right? So I'm super excited to take two films to South by this year. Um, only one of them is in competition. There's only eight docs in competition at South by. The other one is in the spotlight category, which seems to be reserved for projects that have more resources, maybe a cultural connection, but aren't necessarily about being able to be in competition. Um, and I think so what I am what's disappointing about that is to go into spaces that are the spaces that we've kind of attached this emotional energy to of like, this is where we need to be. And to realize that like the amount of space for the thing that we do and love and care for is getting smaller as a result. Thank you for that. And I, I definitely I want to come back to um, that the question about the two films that you have going to South by and kind of your your strategy around that. But I first want to um, just kind of go stick for a minute on the corporate uh, corporate sponsorships. And this is a question for both um, for you and Sierra in terms of that increase of corporate sponsorships and this, you know, this model, um, you know, for profit model for a lot of film festivals. What do you think that filmmakers need to understand about the effect that that has on their overall festival experience? Like, what is what is your kind of. Um, advice, if you will, for filmmakers in that regard. Yeah, I can jump in. Um, also, thank you so much for having me. It's such a joy to be here with both of you. Um, I think I, I really didn't know what I was jumping into uh, for the festival experience as a whole. Um, the premiere was a very heightened uh, experience um, of being in that space, but I think those feelings sort of extended throughout the whole festival cycle for me. Um, and it was, you know, I was coming from these spaces that felt I felt very held in, like I did the Firelight Labs, I did a Chicken and Egg Lab, I did some things at the Sundance Institute, which felt really, really different um, than the, the festival that I premiered at. Um, and so I was coming from this place where I felt like there was such filmmaker community, such support, such intention with the way that we talked about our work and who made what work. And then moving into the festival space um, and going to Sundance for the premiere, it felt like, oh, I think I, I'm i in this space that's really not actually built for me. It, it In some sense, it felt like it was built for everyone but the filmmaker. Um, and I had a real feeling, um, I think in a lot of spaces of like, oh, this is like a networking event for the sales agents and the distributors and the studio executives. This is like a corporate retreat. And I just happen to be sort of like the nice shiny object that's like the, the point of topic um, for all of these other people, but it's not really necessarily about um, me as a filmmaker or necessarily about my project. 
And so I think I came to realize over the course of the year that contrary to what I thought um, and sort of excluding audience, which is a, another thing to touch on that I found to be so important, but the, the film festival experience felt like the moment when it stopped being about the film and stopped and started being about all the noise around the film that everyone stopped watching the films and stopped talking about the art and it was about everything but. And so I think um, that was something that I didn't realize. I thought that the, the festival experience would really be about celebrating the art and sort of like this victory lap for all of this hard work that you put on, you know, that you did throughout the process. Um, but it, it, it felt like a, a marketplace or like a more of like a corporate retreat to me. Um, and so I left realizing that I couldn't expect the festival to, to give me community or to give me an audience. Those are things that I had to build and use the festival as the venue for me to then bring those things and make it what I wanted to, wanted it to be. Or by contrast, I had a lot of really great experiences at festivals where I went in with no expectations and just went in using it as an opportunity to travel to a place that I hadn't been before or for a new life experience that I wanted to have. Um, we had a screening in, in Poland, for example, at Millennium Docs Against Gravity. There was no travel support to get there. It was really, a really expensive trip, but I decided to go because my father is, has Polish heritage and we decided to make it a father-daughter trip and sort of splurged on this festival experience. Mm -hmm. And that was a great experience for me. I didn't spend a ton of time at the festival, but I got to go on a great trip with my dad. And then we saw the film play with Polish subtitles and that was like really fulfilling. And so I think once I shifted my mindset and realized that the bottom had fallen out from the industry and, and what I expected from it, I decided to just sort of like pivot and and take what I could out of it, bring my own community and my own audience to these places, and then also just enjoy it for um, something outside of the industry. Yeah, that's great. that's great. Darcy, did you want to add to that? Um, I just had a really great festival experience in November um, for Commuted, which is Neela Jefferson, who's a Firelight Lab alum, and our project was in the, in the lab. Um, it's a film about by New Orleanians about a New Orleans woman um, and a woman, our subject Danielle Metz is really connected in the community and really beloved in the community. So the hometown premiere was really a priority for us. And it was really nice because of the relationships we have here, we were able to work with the festival to make that community connection actually happen. And we had three like oversold screenings, um, you know, flowers for Danielle everywhere. And when I think about what we could have held out for, I guess, theoretically, if there was a shinier uh, ring somewhere, nothing would have provided Danielle and Naila with the experience of being able to premiere the film in front of their own community in their own hometown. And I think that's different than what, how do we get into the best festival that's going to leverage our career further? And I think part of what I think about is, is and Sierra, you kind of alluded to this, is like, I think there's two reasons to show a film and two reasons to do festivals. One is to connect to your audience or connect to your community and the other is to advance your career and in great play well, you know when it's perfect those things work together but I think sometimes we choose festivals around a sense of prestige that is not resonant in the community or audience that we want to find and I think what I want to make sure I'm doing going forward is making is doing the best to align those things and that it's just not always going to be the right place to premiere at a prestige festival um, if that's not where you're going to find community and audience. One of the things that we really tried to do on the um, Distribution Advocates podcast is, is number one, to have a conversation about, um, you know, it's kind of like redefining success, right? And I think what you were just describing fits into that of, um, you know, what are we going to festivals for or what are, you know, really at the end of the day, at the first question is what did I make this film for? <laughs> you know what I mean? And what's the purpose of the film? Um, and so I, you know, one of the guests that we had on the podcast was uh, uh, Gemma Desai, who was a writer at research. And I wanted to play um, a clip from one of her, uh, one of the segments um, that she had on film festivals and, you know, just really kind of calling into question uh, it's this question again of what is the purpose of film festivals and and sort of what are we 
um, what are we accomplishing? What are we trying to trying to accomplish um, with film festivals? So if we could play that first clip. There's, There's a, a lot, lot of colonial, colonial language, language in the film festival and in the idea of distribution and there's a lot of ideas of extracting, of exploring. So I think it's really interesting that the presentation of the film festival is this idea of hospitality and guests. But actually, when the business is done, it's all about exploitation. It's all about territories and rights. And it's very law-like language, right? There's this like clash you're attracted to this neoliberal idea of hospitality, but actually what's happening is that you will only be needed if you can be exploited. That's like a big thing that I've been thinking with recently, but more materially and less abstractly maybe. The film festival is just a trade fair, isn't it? But I don't know that filmmakers always know that, right? Like, And I think it's presented as this opportunity to make connections based on the work that you've made, but it's never really about that. It's always about who you know. It's about what you've done before. It might be what passport you have. It might be what labs you've been in, or it might be how you have managed to internalise the right language. It might be who your father is. It could be so many different things that allow you to have that door open. So I actually don't know what the function of a film festival is in terms of distribution for most filmmakers who don't have the backing of a studio or a big name producer. Maybe there are others that have felt something of value, but at present, I just don't know where Where that that possibility possibility really really lies lies at a film film festival. festival. I'm curious... um, for both of you, just your reaction to that, and especially that last part that she said, the possibility of uh, a film festival. And I guess the first question I have is, um, what are those factors that come into play uh, or that that play into getting into a top tier festival? Um, and then kind of like a, the second part to that question is like, what are the possibilities? Because <laughs> I, I think she laid out a lot of the, you know, sort of the the, the politics that go into getting into some of these festivals. Um, and maybe you could just share a little bit of your thoughts on um, what the possibilities could be in that. Sure. Sierra, or do you want me to? You can, um, you can jump right in. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I mean, it, it it's of course it's not only merit right of course it isn't we know that um it's certainly there uh before this like there's so many films that are going to premiere this weekend at south by southwest that are going to premiere at the film festival and then be directly on major streamers like and so the film festival is a press junket for their film that is not what i do right i don't have films that can that do that and so it feels like a very different playing field And like, there's this like, and almost like the competition films are like our little indie darlings and enjoy this moment, right? But then the amount of space and audience, and and I'm sure programmers have to consider audience too. Like, you know, you can't only um, program, you know, experimental 14 hour films like that one film in Berlin, but it's, it's, again, it's like, there are things that are not the same. We are we are apples and oranges to some of the films that are being booked, and they are not being booked because they need a festival platform in order to build access to audience because they already have that. So it really feels like when we're going into some festivals with with independently funded and independently um, created documentaries, we're we're just not able to come with the same uh, resources and opportunities and and to take advantage of it in the same way, and even more so when the airspace and press time uh, is taken up by projects that already are going to premiere already and have audience. Um, so I think that's that's a big part of it. Um, and then, yeah, we all know relationships are uh, tie into it. I mean, it's happened with films that I've gotten into places. I'm not going to say that I haven't. If I have relationships, I'm going to try to, in a non-transactional, not weird way, exercise them uh, because that is the game that we have to play. Um, And then there's also like weird things that get through. Like, um, so I think that's really great too, but it is, it is certainly not just because you made a great movie. Are you going to get to show in, especially in the top tier festivals? I'm curious, um, Sierra, because you had a, a really great Sundance debut. Um, uh, can you talk a little bit about your experience at Sundance and 
what happened with the film after its premiere? Yeah, yeah. Something that you were saying, Darcy, made me think about, um, so my film is called Junam, and it's about my experience of my Iranian identity, my fractured Iranian identity as someone who grows up in the diaspora, um, along with my mother's experience of being an Iranian woman, my grandmother's experience with being Iranian, each of our relationships with Iran from the outside. It's like about longing of not having access to this part of our identities and this place. And it was a really interesting time to premiere a film like that at Sundance um, in January, 2023, because at the time, Iran was in the middle of these women life freedom protests. It was the beginning of what we were all hoping was gonna be the next revolution. Suddenly my film was timely in this way that it might not have been if I applied this year or the year before, even though for me, it was always timely. It's my experience of my identity. For the festival, it, I'm sure it was part of their consideration that it was timely in this new way and maybe relevant for audiences in a new way. And so it was an interesting time to premiere that film because I think a lot of the industry came with certain assumptions about what this film would be and what films about Iranians should be about and what they should teach other people, um, what sort of stylistic or visual approaches one should use. And my film wasn't any of those expectations, um, which I'm, I am really proud of and, and was the intent to tell my personal experience of my identity. But for a lot of like the big trade reviewers, a lot of the industry, this was not the right type of Iranian story that they wanted. This wasn't footage coming out of Iran right now. This wasn't me as a stand-in for a geopolitical explanation. Um, and so that was a real shock for me is feeling this, this like crazy um, difference between suddenly sort of like this experience of being sort of thrown to the dogs of like, wow, this industry is so backwards, so behind what the audience is taking from this film or these other creative incubate, incubation spaces that I've been in with this film. Um, and then moving past the premiere at Sundance, I think we started to see over time how it being a film about diaspora was really affecting some of the programming decisions. Because suddenly here's all these film festivals and they're looking for what's their film about Iran going to be this year because it's in the news. And my film isn't in Iran. By definition, it's about not being in Iran, not being connected to Iran, this longing to feel that connection. But when I'm sure these programming decisions are happening on the festival circuit, my film isn't Iranian enough, which is deeply ironic. I, you know, that's what the story is about, about me not feeling Iranian enough. Um, but it was a really complex feeling for me because that's sort of the whole point of a diaspora film about being neither here nor there. But I could see the film slipping into the cracks of being neither here nor there for programmers um, in this way that I think uh, was really disappointing because you expect these festivals to be a place of nuance. And of course there's exceptions, there's incredible festivals that are doing a great job of this. But I started to see that pattern um, where a diaspora film like mine wasn't, uh, didn't fit the bill for the Iranian film that they wanted in their festival. Not to say that those films coming out of Iran weren't incredibly important to platform, but just mm -hmm. that there was a, um, there wasn't space for, uh, something that was a little bit less um, pointed. You spoke about, um, you know, your expectations going, like how it, the experience didn't meet your expectations. I'm, I'm curious for you, Darcy, as a producer, when you're going into film festivals, how are you, um, you know, when you're, as, as a producer, how are you um, talking to your directors about, strategy when you go into the film festival process or when you're planning which festivals to go to how do you have that conversation with the directors that you work with and and what's some of the misunderstandings or assumptions that they have about the the process um i i try to not be as cynical as sometimes i feel about it so that they can enjoy it and it's it's um as a producer i go I take more films out than any of my directors do right because I work on multiple projects uh at a time and um so trying to remember that for each of my filmmakers especially like the two that are going to South by that's their first film it's their first feature that they're releasing both of them and so just 
trying to remember that it's supposed to be exciting for them or it is exciting for them and I want to support that. Um, I think there's a misunderstanding that it costs a lot of money to go to film festivals, which Sierra um, indicated, but also that film festivals exist in the economy of film sales. And this, especially if you're going without a distribution partner into a film festival, you, irrespective of where you premiere, you're looking at it as a kind of market. Um, the film trades and film PR are trained to only cover films at the time of an event, an eventized moment. Film festivals are that event. So you're going into the film festival as a PR event for your film. Um, among other things. So you either are doing publicity on your own or you're hiring a publicist, right? Um, you want to ensure your film before you go out. Um, you want to, you know, you, you want to throw a party. Parties cost money. Like, and I think there's a kind of sense of like what you do with a film. You take it out. You have a publicist. You throw a party. You're doing these kind of X, like um, all of these things. You should have a sales agent. Um, I, I said, it's like when you, the other day, it's like going to the family reunion and everybody wants to know when you're going to get married. It's like, do you have a sales agent? Do you have a sales agent? Right. So like all of these things are kind of coming at you, uh, at the moment of your premiere. It's also right after you're exhausted from delivering your film and you're trying to make a lot of very expensive decisions, um, really quickly as you arrive at that moment. And I think what is hard for a lot of directors is not to imbue that moment with the entirety of the value of their film's release. I think it's difficult to say to someone, you know, this film's going to be in festivals for a year or maybe two, right? Um, the short I had at Sundance in 2023 is playing now uh, at Cleveland, right? It's still, it's still going. The neutral ground still gets booked at things. Um, so I think that the life of the film and festivals, especially if you don't have a broadcast date or a stream date, can be very long. Um, like Sierra pointed out, a lot of them don't pay for travel. Some of them do. Um, they don't know that sometimes you can get screening fees and sometimes you can't. Um, and so I think part of it is just understanding that the launch is a, that your launch through a festival system is another, it is distribution and it is it has inherent costs. And then I think, um, again, what we were just talking about, like, what do you want out of a festival? Like, do you want to be surrounded by peers? Do you want to network with industry types? Do you need to have an experience for, depending on what your film is, for your subjects? Do you, Are you seeking to find audience? And how do you define audience? Because I think, like, a thing that happened with the Commuta premiere is that the audience that wanted to see Danielle on screen in Danielle's film is not an audience that comes out to film festivals. So there were moments of great stress where people came and did not understand a rush line. They did not understand why they wouldn't be able to get into the film with their ticket five minutes before screening time because they don't live in a world where there's rush lines. So like literal just like language difference between the people that we we know are our audience and who's coming to film festivals. And so how do we bridge all of that? And I think that's, um, it's going to be slightly different for every film. Uh, but it, we tried, I want to think more creatively about how we bring films out to the world than let's just go, we're going to shoot for the top five and then take what's left. Because there's a lot of, I've also found a lot of like really small festivals that have a lot of really important industry people who kind of secretly go to that festival, right? Or you know, a lot of people from Hollywood live in Montana and go to the Big Sky Documentary Film Festival, right? You find people who have their niche interests and those interests might be more aligned to the film you're making at more niche festivals. Um, so I think thinking a little broader is something I want directors to do, but I also understand it's your baby. You went to school probably for film and you were told to go to Sundance Tribeca South by Toronto, right? And that, and that you were told that that is the place to be and you want to be there, right? Um, so I think part of it is like our own, like, you know, getting the scales away from our eyes a little bit about disentangling our dreams of our own career from the reality of the work we're making and finding the place that kind of bridges that gap. Just curious, um, just real quick, because I do want to um, talk about awards a little bit, but I'm curious, you know, you have two films that are going to South by do those film without telling us, you know, your whole, all the secrets and all your strategy. Do you, do those films have different goals? Are you kind of going into the festival with, you know, different things in sight? Can you talk about that just a little bit? We're very different films um, in every way. Um, one of them's editorial budget is bigger than the whole production budget of the other film. So they come from just very different models of, of how you make documentary. 
um, and they come with different resources. Um, so for role play, which is the you know micro budget indie film, um, we are we are launching it to get the director Katie. Her it is her first feature. She's going out in the world. We don't have distribution and we don't have a celebrity and we don't have true crime and it's not about a cult. So we know that our like needle to thread to sales directly is going to be very small. And we're really, I think, ready for a longer uh, festival run and kind of building audience more organically and figuring out that those distribution partners. Um, we know that we're going to be on the festival circuit for a year. A King Like Me is um, comes with a lot kind of bigger player partners, a bigger team and um, their hope is to make a sale. So there are different approaches and different, I don't know, scales in terms of um, what's happening during the festival and how their expectations for what the festival will do. Mm -hmm. And then, so like I said, I do want to move into um, awards and talk about that a little bit and, and, and also eventually talk about kind of that track from festivals to awards. But Sierra, um, your film, so typically films that come out of Sundance, you know, some of them win awards as yours did, congratulations. And that kind of starts to build a momentum um, toward big awards later in the year. Um, what did you learn about the award system when it came time for you to put a uh, Junam up for consideration? Yeah, I, I don't think I thought anything about awards before this film. Um, I just knew that people got them and someone gave it to them. <laughs> I didn't realize that you had to apply for awards. I didn't realize that you had to, that there was application fees to submit to awards. Um, I didn't realize that if you got nominated for some of those awards, you have to then pay to have a seat at the literal table of your award ceremony. There were so many, and I, I honestly, I still don't really understand the award system. Um, there are still so many awards that I, I don't know when the application is. I, I missed some window that I didn't even know existed. There is so many, there's so much, um, you know, lack of transparency about how it works. I just sort of thought, okay, my film's on the festival circuit now, the the powers to be will like it or not, and they may or may not give me an award. And for some awards at festivals, that, that's how it worked if I was in competition. You know, that's how I got an award at Cleveland or some of these other festivals. Um, but in terms of like the bigger awards season, I had no idea that I had to submit to anything. Um, and we really weren't considering putting the film up for Oscar consideration um, because we had no money. Um, so there was really no campaign that we could launch um, until I got a call from another filmmaker, Joe Peeler, who made a film called Bad Press, uh, who was on the festival circuit with me. And I met him at a different festival and he called me and said, hey, are you guys considering putting your film up for consideration? And I told him everything that I told you now, I really hadn't thought about it. It didn't seem like it was even possible with um, just the, the lack of resources that we had. And he said, hey, you know, these other filmmakers, they made this film called King, King Cole. They're trying to bring these film teams together and maybe we can all pool resources and do some sort of collective campaign together if you were interested in considering putting your film up for consideration. And so that's sort of like, you know, gave us a little bit of enthusiasm and hope that this is something that we could do and it was like this refreshing difference from being in competition with other filmmakers to suddenly oh can we work together because we have this tiny team with a t very limited amount of resources but together we have so much more power and so that's when it that's when it actually became an idea for us but we had to sort of step back and think okay, what do we want from this? Because, you know, we're not expecting to win anything. Even getting shortlisted is a massive reach. But what could this do for us outside of um, getting an actual award? Um, and so I think that's when we started to think about how the, the act of doing something together with other filmmakers was such a beautiful com uh, community building act in and of itself um, that we really wanted to be a part of. And also it was a way to use this to continue to get the film out to audiences, specifically the Iranian American community. We made a choice to really pivot to focusing on that uh, and using awards to continue to focus on that. Um, so yeah, that's sort of in a nutshell how we were thinking about awards. 
I love that idea of the collective power, like pooling your resources and coming together um, to try and, you know, get through it together and, and pool your resources. I'm curious, um, uh, Darcy, if you, for anyone that's listening, can you um, thread the needle, if there is a needle to be thread <laughs> on the um, Festival to Awards pipeline? Okay. Um, can, yeah, can you just lay that out? I think it's really important for what Sierra said, awards cost money. They are not free recognition of your incredible work by random strangers. These award giving entities are organizations made up of members who also work in your industry, kind of, or critics or something like that. And they operate themselves in some part based on your submission fees and the, you know, you're paying for the dinner uh, that you go to to receive your award. And yet it's also, in some cases, really beautiful to be surrounded by a community of your peers, right? And to be celebrated in that way. And I think I'm a Leo and uh, I love being praised. So I get it. Um, but um, so, yeah, so you started a film festival. There's a list of Oscar qualifying, qualifying film festivals as the great way to start. So when you're planning your festival strategy, you should be ensuring that at least one of the Oscar qualifying film festivals is on your list where you want to be. And you also have to like, some of them are just Oscar qualifying for shorts, uh, some of them for features, right? So, and you should also plan your both US and international film festivals because a lot of the Oscar qualifying festivals are international festivals. So you, your festival strategy should start with an intention to ensure that your film screens at one of those Oscar qualifying film festivals. If you win an award at one of those festivals, you are all automatically qualified for Oscars, and then you can presume you're qualified for everything else. I think Oscars is the highest level of qualification. Another thing people do is, um, or another qualifi qualifying element that you can do in the absence of that is to have a theatrical run in a major city. Um, you can do that by having a theatrical distributor, of course. Um, you can also do that by partnering with independent cinemas. Um, I really like to shout out DCTV's Firehouse Theater, which has been doing some amazing programming and supporting filmmakers who are needing a theatrical run in order to be qualified. Um, so those are things you have to do in order to be qualified for an Oscar. And again, you're, you're thinking of that as you're building your strategy for going out into the world. Um, you then have to get a calendar together. I think um, I think Spirit Awards um, or IDA Awards is first in like September. And then you're starting to plan all of your submissions. They cost money. Not only do they cost money, but then there are kind of um, conventions of marketing to the, the world, right? So like people who are in the running for an Oscar run FYC for your consideration campaigns. And IDA has a program to waive some of the costs of those advertising or to be in their screening room. Um, and specifically if you're BIPOC or other kind of um, marginalized group filmmaker, you should absolutely be trying to get into that program so you don't have to pay for it. But you will be agog at how much those um, advertisements cost. Um, I think... I'll just say a, a really wonderful film that got nominated and didn't win an Oscar um, did kind of like a private session on their campaign and they spent $250,000 to get on the, to get nominated. And that was by all uh, accountings, the lowest amount the year that they were nominated. So you then you wait and you wait for the short lists and the ranking and deadline. And you decide if, you know, how much money you're going to spend based on, what comes out there's like deadline does like a list and you know one year I think the neutral ground was right below the Justin Bieber doc and we were like I don't know if we're going to make it to short list of that but next year we're going to beat the Justin Bieber doc um with the next film so then you wait and you decide how much money you're going to spend some of the awards really really reward wine and cheese toasts in LA and special screenings with um, members of their boards. And some of them, I think the Emmys, it's, it's completely frowned upon to do any kind of politicking. Um, so you're just going in, finding out what the deadlines are, delivering on them and paying money and hoping and waiting on the people who are behind the curtain to recognize your work. And that's not to take away from any awards that anybody's gotten, right? Like, you know, Sierra was just nominated for an Indie Spirit Award and all of the films that were nominated in, in your category were amazing and were like amazing filmmakers, right? So it's not to say that those awards don't get it right. Um, it is just, again, I don't come from intergenerational wealth. I imagine that the majority of the people who are uh, logged into the Zoom don't come from intergenerational wealth. We have already 
raised an American mortgage to get this film done, right? And we are also concerned with so many other things and the idea of doing awards campaigns can be really, really daunting. Um, and 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 then the best version of it, I think, is what Sierra um, and Diane um, and Joe did. Um, and when you utilize that campaign to further connect with audiences, and that's hopefully the point, right, is to, to allow more, another space for audiences to engage with your film. So I know um, we're, we have some questions. We, I want to make sure we leave time for questions. Um, the one, one thing I did want to um, just ask to pose to both of you, what do you think it would take for a film to survive, to find distribution, um, to get out into the world um, without going the festival route? Do you think that that is a possibility? Do you think it's ridiculous and silly? You know, what are what are the um or is it impossible? You know, what do you think is the is what are the options for filmmakers given everything that you've laid out in terms of cost, in terms of um, you know, getting into the festival? Can you talk about that a little bit? I'm interested. I'll let you take it away, Darcy, because I gotta <laughs> say. It beats me. I have been on the festival circuit. We don't have distribution. Many of my peers were on the festival circuit, premiered at incredible festivals, had a great run, and they don't have distribution. Um, and so I think the question is really like, what is distribution now? And what does it take to, to do distribution at all? Sort of festivals don't seem to make much of a difference um, either way, from what I've seen, at least this last year. And so I'm sort of reimagining what distribution is. You know, it's like a really simple, we've made a product, we've made a piece of art. We want people to watch it and say, oh, hey, cool. And now I have some new thoughts in my head. It's a pretty simple exchange, but there seems to be all of this stuff in the middle that complicates it and makes it so confusing. And so I'm just, I'm in a space right now of just thinking, okay, how can I just get this film to people? I don't need to make money off of it. I don't need to, you know, get some big return on investment. I just want people to see it and have a place to see it. And so I don't have, I wish I had the answers and maybe Darcy, you have, <laughs> maybe Darcy, you have the answers, but um, I think it's like a bigger question of what even is distribution now? I think I, I, a million percent agree. Like what is distribution? And I think this is a question that Avril and, and everybody at DA is asking. Like, I'll say this, this is my like wild idea is like, how, how is everybody consuming this right now? We're on YouTube, right? Um, how often a day do I go to YouTube all the time, right? And there are ways to monetize YouTube distribution. And I think the only thing keeping a lot of us from doing it is um, a confusion about like maybe that there's a big check somewhere and that somebody somehow a Netflix billionaire is going to save us, right? And then probably a little bit like of inherent classism in our own minds of like, that feels like a lesser than solution for how to get right. That doesn't, that doesn't bespeak avant-garde cinema to put your film on YouTube. Um, that's where there's definitely audiences there. Right. I think a question that I have is like how um, the notion of exclusivity, the notion of, ex uh, of windowing, the notion of, of broadcast premieres, and that's like the value of your film exists as long as you hold it tightly. And then once you let it out in the world, you cease to have value to distributors uh, is really interesting. And I don't know which filmmaker that I work with will say to me, yes, Darcy, let's just put it on YouTube, monetize it and see how much money we make. But I can tell you that um, Paula Iself and I made a short last year that is on PBS's YouTube and it is also a Vimeo staff pick. And one of my greatest joys is to go on Vimeo and see how many people who have watched our little film because it's 30,000 people, which is more than I thought would watch the film, uh, right? And so the power of like owning your own analytics, owning your own data, owning your own film, is really interesting to me. Um, I don't know if I'll ever have a director I work with who is like, yeah, let's do it. Because I understand, it's not to say that I don't understand why we do the things we do, but I'm really interested in, you know, I, I have had films distributed on major platforms and it's really cool and exciting. And then you never find out how many people watched your film when you always feel a little bit like if you had done the marketing, you could have done it a little bit better if you'd been in charge of creating the marketing assets. And you always feel like, you know, it's great, but you just, 
let your film out and someone else has it and then they 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 hold it until such time as it's not valuable to them and you're not in control of it anymore. So I don't know if YouTube is the solution. I do recognize that it's also a tech company owned by billionaires, but I think it's an interesting idea to think about democratizing distribution a little bit more and what would it mean for us as filmmakers to release to to in both senses of the world to release our preconceived notions about that yeah and you know these are exactly the things that we want to explore with distribution advocates um you know and i think right now just exactly what you're saying darcy it's you know it's kind of an experiment, you know, of trying to find new models. And I think that there are new models out there, but it, you know, it's going to require somebody <laughs> to do it and not just do it. One of the things we always say at Distribution Advocates, it's not just do it, but to document it, right? I think part of the reason why people have these notions about like, you know, I'll be the one to win the award and the, this and that, it's because that's what, those are the cases that are documented. Those are the ones that are out there, you know? And so we need those positive cases and positive stories of people who have gone a different route and have been able to document it in a way that other people know that there is another alternative that exists. Um, I wanna close out with, um, you know, before we jump into questions, I just, you know, because of everything you guys have um, just said, I just wanna play one last clip from the, uh, from the podcast. Um, and I believe this one is also from uh, Gemma Desai. Um, and it, it's just to kind of leave us with this question of what do we want from film festivals? And I think it's something for all of us to think about in terms of what is the end goal here um, and what type of community we're trying to build, what type of film community we're trying to build. So if we could play um, what do we want from film festivals? Truly thinking about what we want to share with each other. I want to go back to that thing of desire. If there was any advice to filmmakers about how they could navigate this, it would be to think about what matters to you. And I say that to everybody in the film industry. I think that the film festival is a mirror of what matters to us right now. It's a mirror of our collective desires. So it's doing its work. It's working for something, right? But obviously we realise it's not working for everybody. So it depends what we want. Do we want it to work for the few? Are we okay with this hierarchical way? Are we all right with these flashpoints of interest where a few of us are let in and then this silence and, and reassertion of the values? Are we okay with this logic where the only real thing as a festival programmer you can do is to decide what comes in and out? You can't shift the conditions in which something is made or seen or translated. It's just this sort of gate that we can open or close. If we're okay with all of that, then yes, a film festival is useful. If we're not okay and we want to undo those things and those logics, then I don't think the film festival is a useful model for us at all. Everything, Everything that the film, film festival, festival stands, stands for are, are about, about keeping, keeping people, people in and, and out. out. Ouch. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> okay. I mean, it's something to think about. And, you know, I would encourage everyone to listen to the podcast and hear you know, the rest of Gemma's um, comments, I think she had a lot to say that gave us some things to think about in terms of the future um, of film festivals, but of distribution as a whole. Um, one of the, I'll, I'll jump to the um, audience questions real quick. Um, we do have a question uh, about what are some of the hidden gem festivals where you had positive experiences? I'm so happy someone asked this question. Sierra, do you want to go first? Sure. Yeah, I actually would love to build a database of every filmmaker's hidden gems. Um, I think next film I do, I'll do a few of like the best premiere, whatever festival I can get into that like has the most clout to put it on whatever pedestal and then just the hidden gems from there on out. Um, one, that, one of the last festivals that we did last year was... Uh, called the Sharjah Film Platform. Um, I believe it was invite only at the time, but they might be opening it up. It was an incredible festival. They flew everyone out there to Sharjah. They put us up in a beach resort for 10 days. There were rose petals on the bed when I arrived. And then they had a curation of week-long tours to different uh, art installations and exhibits throughout Sharjah for the filmmakers that they brought to the festival. So I was like, just so um, shocked at how much intention was put towards 
uh, having the filmmakers meet each other and having the filmmakers experience other art around them. It felt like the festival was almost more for the filmmakers in some ways than it was about necessarily the programming of the festival itself. Um, and then True False and Camden are two like huge, um, huge gems in my book that really uplifted me um, over this past year. Right. Um, I'm going to check that out. I don't have a lot of experience in international festivals because most of my films are like super American. Um, hopefully we'll change that with Jason's film. Um, I really loved CPH Docs. I thought it was kind of a nerdy film festival for films filmmakers, but also had such a good cinema culture in Copenhagen um, so that there were tons of cinemas and tons of audiences. I had a great time. Um, in the United States, I love True False Camden, really loved Big Sky. Um, I thought it was really like small and lovely. I'm a huge fan of the New Orleans Film Festival. I think they do a really good job of balancing that combination of like um, large scale curation that's in the film world and also making sure Louisiana and New Orleans filmmakers get seen and having filmmaker support and having some industry folks um, and really great parties. Uh, I love Third Horizon, uh, which is a Caribbean film festival based in Miami. Um, and um, Kukaloris is really great in North Carolina. Um, yeah, there, oh, and Hot Springs. Hot Springs is a, is a blast. It's just, you know, weird little town in Arkansas showing great documentaries. Um, okay, I think we have time for one more question. Um, what are your thoughts about submitting two feature films to the same festival in one year? Do you have any tactics to tactics to recommend if you have two films? I, well, I mean, I have two films, um, but I'm not the director, I'm a producer. So I think they're very different films, different film teams. Um, and um, I didn't expect it that both would get in. I was happy that they did. Um, and I know a couple of filmmakers right now who have a, like multiple shorts that are on the circuit. Again, you, you know, you finish films at whenever they're finished and they get accepted when they get accepted. Um, I do think that if you have two films that are similar, you should maybe pick one if you want to be truly discerned. And if you have two films that are different, you should maybe have a separate festival strategy for each film that may overlap, but isn't like your whole festival strategy for each film is exactly the same. Awesome. Uh, I think we are out of time. Um, I will say I did see a question about uh, if you get a distributor who shows it and who makes money, basically what is distribution? I do want to say, which is like, <laughs> you know, an important question. <laughs> Um, I will say we did just come out with an episode yesterday on distribution. It is called distribution <laughs> and it lays out uh, what distribution is. So you may want to listen to that episode of the podcast um, in particular. Uh, I want to thank Darcy and Sierra for joining this wonderful and compelling conversation uh, about festivals and awards um, pipeline. I encourage you all of you to listen to the podcast series that we at Distribution Advocates have just produced. Um, it dives deep into our documentary industry from awards to festivals, sales agents, and funders. You can listen to Distribution Advocates Presents on Apple, on Spotify, on iHeartRadio, and on the DA, the Distribution Advocates Substack, which is distributionadvocates.substack.com. Uh, to learn more about Firelight Media, uh, for more on our panelists or to see more beyond resilience conversations like this one, visit firelightmedia.tv. Thank you and have a great evening. <laughs>